Trapped in the Bando, written by G. Hill. Dedication. After five years of trials and tribulations, I finally published my first book at 25 years old. While writing this book, I've grown as an individual as well as a writer. After years of editing, I finally completed the final copy. This book is a reflection of patience, perseverance, and tenacity. I want to dedicate this book to whoever has dreams that seem intangible but still have the courage to chase them. Know that accomplishing your goals may, at times, seem unrealistic. Understand that the human mind will never conceive anything it does not have the potential to attain. It is the indisputable truth that you can achieve what you visualize. This book is dedicated to all individuals who are chasing their dreams and putting their utmost effort into accomplishing them. Thank you for reading and joy. Chapter 1 Yo, Jizzle, pass me the damn wood, damn. Yo, fat lip ass, always want to chief all the weed, man. Can I smoke with you, motherfucker? Tez asked in an aggressive but jubilant tone. Jizzle let out a deep laugh. Can I at least puff this a few more times, my brother? He inhaled the backwoods stuff with the most potent weed you could smoke. It's enough weed for everybody, he replied, holding in his breath and passing the backwood to Tez. Jizzle shook his head, pulling a large gulp of weed from a nearby Ziploc bag. He glanced out the window of his front room, then to the weed, and then to Tez. We smoked a whole ounce of weed, and you want a trip, ain't that a bitch? I know what your problem is, my brother. You are higher than a motherfucker. God damn, I can see it in your eyes. Tez inhales the smoke and then starts coughing ferociously. Damn, bro, you need some water with yo dry neck ass. Jizzle chuckle, scratching his braids and pointing toward his kitchen. Shut up, nigga, Tez said, gulping for air as his lungs fought for oxygen. He turned to face Jizzle on the other end of the couch with a stupid grin. I ain't gonna lie, this is some good ass weed. I'm higher than a giraffe's pussy. Tez and Jizzle were the best of friends. They had known each other since childhood and grew up on the same block. They lived on Arlington Street right off Six Mile. Their family was different but around the same environment, so they shared a parallel culture. They were like brothers. Tez was a typical Detroit-looking motherfucker. Light skin, skinny with a nappy ass fro, and known for wearing fake Buffs Cartier glasses. Tez was the type to try to sell weed but didn't know how to bag it up. He always attempted to portray the role of being a gangster because of who his father was, the biggest drug dealer in the neighborhood. That's why he had a wild temper and his actions were unpredictable. Recently, Tez has been acting extra hype since he was at the beginning of his rap career, and his first mixtape release party was coming soon. Tez understood that they had an image to uphold in the streets. Jizzle was about six foot three, two 250 pounds, all solid muscle. He had brown skin with braids. Despite his massive size, he always tried to avoid conflict and was very passive. Jizzle didn't want any involvement in the toxic elements of living in Detroit and the street life. It was a hot, beautiful day in July on the east side of Detroit. Today they smoked at Jizzle's house on some of the best marijuana in the city. Jizzle and Tez were both chronic smokers and smoked with each other prevalently. On this particular day, Tez's pockets were a little heavy, so he purchased a surplus of weed for them to enjoy. Their marijuana ritual was interrupted by a surprise visit. Their friend Lowe parked his car in front of Jizzle's house. Lowe was about six feet tall, built strong but not too bulky, and his dark skin was enriched with intricate tattoos. Lowe stumbled out of his car and rushed through the front door. His body language screamed that some fucked up shit happened. Lowe stared at them, chilling on the couch. Some crazy ass shit just went down. What you mean, bro? Tez and Jizzle said in unison. Lowe was frantic. Sweat dripped down his face as he explained. The robbery. The fucking robbery went WW wrong. Lowe started pacing back and forth, throwing his arms around. Me and Warren tried to rob the plug around the corner, and the shit went bad. 
When I say bad, I mean bad. I'm talking about this shit right here fucked up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Breathe in, breathe out, hit the weed and tell us what happened on some Dr. Phil shit, said Tez. Tez passed low the weed and low hit it several times. Low fingers were trembling with trepidation. His eyes wandered in hysteria. It was apparent by how he was acting that he was deeply disturbed. What happened? Tez asked again, in an interrogatory way. Lowe stopped in his tracks and just stared at both of them. Lowe tilted his head in disappointment. I was just with Juan. We tried to hit a lick on the trap house off John R. I heard they were moving pounds over there. We went by there to scope the shit out. You feel me. We peeped that they left their little hoe-ass spot worker to take care of the trap. Lowe approached a chair in the corner of the room and sat down quietly for a few seconds. Lowe took another puff and passed the weed to Jizzle. Lowe continued the story. Me and Juan were like, this is a perfect money-making opportunity. So I had Juan set the play. I told him I would knock at the door and fake it like I was about to shop. Then he would creep up on the motherfucker with the strap. It was a perfect plan, right? But you know shit can never go as planned. What you mean? Asked Jizzle. Me and Juan got in the car, drove to the spot, and waited outside for a few minutes. We waited until the trap got slow. I was about to knock at the door, but it was already open, so I walked in. When I first walked in, I saw the spot worker laid out on the floor. At first, I thought he was dead. I further inspected the body, you feel me. He was still breathing but unconscious. In my mind, I'm thinking he was just high as hell off a pill or something. What happened after that? Jizzle asked in between, blowing smoke clouds in the air. Right after that, Juan burst through the door with the strap, looking scared straight. He was in there looking like a full-blown rookie. I damn near got to laughing at his goofy ass, said Lowe with a slight smirk. Juan walks in and boom! He starts panicking when he sees the spot worker's body on the floor. He thought I shot him. I asked Juan, how am I going to shoot the nigga and you got the gun? I told Juan he's probably just high off some pills or lean. I told Juan to watch him on the floor while I find the dope. Simple as that. But Juan ass fucked it all up. Los fists tightened with hostility. I went in the back, looking for anything I could find. I ain't find shit. I went through hell and back looking for anything. I ain't find not a damn thing. When I returned to the front, I saw Juan on straight bullshit. Juan let the nigga that was lying on the floor get up. How can you let somebody lying on the ground get up when you have a whole gun on you? He started to chase Juan around the house. I looked at bro like, what the fuck are you doing? You have a whole gun in your hand. You better shoot this fool. I saw the bitch in his eyes. Juan was not about it. Low clasped his hands together. Yo, our bro was scared. He let the man run up to him, and they started fighting. I don't know what the fuck this nigga was doing. He bit the shit out of Juan's ear, like Mike Tyson did Evander Holyfield. And that's when Juan dropped the gun. When the gun dropped, a round went off and shot Juan in his leg, then he fell to the ground. Lowe started making gestures with his hands again. The whole room got silent for a minute. Me and old dude who bit Juan were both looking like, Oh, shit! Lowe paused. He couldn't believe what he was about to say next. Lowe swallowed hard, staring out the window across the street at the neighbor's house. Sighing, he gave them the final piece of the story. Then... Then that motherfucker jumped on him and started biting him like he was a steak dinner. The world seemed to stop briefly before Lowe slowly turned his attention to Jizzle and Tez. Y'all bitch-ass niggas better not snitch on me. Tez snapped at Lowe, shut the fuck up and finish the story. You know we're solid. Lowe shook his shoulders, proceeding with the story. So I ain't gonna lie, I froze for a minute. I'm watching some random-ass person trying to eat Juan. He was biting all over his arms and shit. Juan was trying to fight back, but you know he can't fight. So, I'm like, shit, I ain't about to fight no zombie. I ran over and grabbed the gun as any smart person would. I pointed the gun at him like this and shot him. 
I damn near emptied the whole clip. Oh, shit, whispered Tez and Jizzle. Hold on, hold on. I'm not done. Lo continued. At this point, Juan is still on the floor. I told him to get his soft ass up. He slowly got up. I told him we needed to hurry up and get the fuck out of there before the police come. We ran out of the house, hopped in the car, and drove off. So now we're driving down seven miles. Out of nowhere, he starts tripping. Juan starts foaming at the mouth like he has rabies or something. I looked at him and asked him, Are you good? You need some water? He just looked at me, and his eyes were red like he had pink eye. What happened next? Jizzle asked. I tried to be nice and check on him. This fool tried to bite me. Almost made me crash the damn car. And he kept trying to bite me, so I pulled over on the street and got out. I'm ready to whoop his ass. I got out of the car and yanked open the door. This fool tripped out of the car. It's like Juan's motor skills were completely off. But he got to his feet. I asked Juan, yo, what is wrong with you? I got no answer. He just started chasing me around the car in circles. So where the fuck Juan at now? Asked Tez. Lo put his head down in shame and stiffened in his seat. That's the fucked up part. They got him. The police came flying down the street and saw us. The police shot him. Jizzle and Tez's faces were in shock and disbelief. Lo sighed, continuing to tell the once entertaining, but now tragic story. They told him to freeze, but he didn't listen. I don't know what the fuck was wrong with him. Juan started to run towards the police. What kind of nigga runs to the police? Questioned Lo as he threw his hands in the air in a morning motion. They shot him so many times. I was scared for my life. I thought I was next. I hopped in the car and drove as fast as possible to escape, Lo said in sorrow. The room was silent for a moment. Everybody had a blank look on their face. It was either the fact that they were high or that their friend had just been killed. The ambiance in the room went from chill to gloomy. All of them were distraught. Tez grew with animosity and pulled his gun out. Man, fuck the police. Next time I see the police, I'ma shoot they ass. They think they can shoot us and get away with it. Yeah, all right. I got something for they ass next time I see them. I'm about to make a diss song to them. You ain't gonna do shit, said Lo peevishly. Yeah, all right. As soon as you try something, they'll shoot you just like they did, Juan. You think you're doing something with that little ass Glock? Jizzle remained quiet the whole time in deep thought with a lugubrious look. His mind was bewildered. Tez was filled with anger and rage, ready to shoot at anything. Lo was traumatized. There were so many emotions in the room. It was a mix of hate, consternation, and melancholy. Tez, Lo, and Jizzle all shared a strong bond with Juan. They all were like brothers. Juan was the good kid out of the group. Juan really had no business being involved in the robbery. Juan had a scholarship to start college in the fall. Sadly, he won't get the chance to do it. Lo had a sense of feeling responsible for having him in that predicament in the first place. Especially since Juan was the youngest and Lo was the oldest out of the group. Tez jumped off the couch and squares up with Lo, nigga, this yo fault. How's this bullshit my fault? Replied Lo with fists balled up in indignation. You know Juan had no business doing that shit. He ain't even that type of a person. Before Lo could say anything back, Tez flew off the handle. You bitch ass nigga! Lo looked at Tez as if he didn't recognize who he was. You think you tough? Lo said in a calm but threatening. Tone. Lo then says, I will beat your ass. I'll knock your ass the fuck out like Debo off of Friday. Don't fucking play with me. This weed must got you tripping, little nigga. Tez throws a punch. Lo dodges it and body slams Tez to the ground. Tez tries to put up a fight but isn't strong enough. Lo overpowers him and starts punching him. Brutally in the face. See, I told your dumb ass to sit down said Lo as he struck Tez's face. Jizzle's overly strong ass came out of nowhere and tackled Lo off Tez. Jizzle stood over them, 
Y'all need to stop fighting. We just lost our brother Juan and y'all ignorant ass niggas want to fight? Fuck both of y'all. I'm leaving, Lo said. Tez and Lo looked at each other with a grim, no exchange of words. Lo walked out of the house dramatically and got in the car. He put his foot on the pedal and stabbed off as fast as he could, angered by the fact that Tez accused him of being the reason. Juan died. In reality, Tez was right. Lo knew that Juan was very vulnerable and unprepared for a robbery. The death of his friend started to matriculate through his thoughts gradually. Lo understood that Juan would still be alive if he had never put Juan in that predicament. What bothered Lo even more was the behavior of the man he killed during the robbery. The way the person attacked Juan, not trying to fight him but trying to eat him, and the cannibalistic way the person bit and tore Juan's flesh off, or the carnivorous stare that Juan gave him before attacking him. Lo knew something was wrong, but he could not figure out what. Tears started to tumble down Lo's face, and flashbacks of Juan getting shot replayed in his head. He screamed, hitting his steering wheel, lamenting the death of his close friend. His mind was debilitated. His thoughts were in disarray. Lo drove in sorrow, bemoaning his friend's death. He could not get rid of the image of Juan lying there with bullet holes through him. Then a vindictive vibe possessed Lo. The tears stopped descending down his face, and acrimonious energy radiated from him. Nothing but getting even with the police was on his agenda. Chapter 2 Lo drove with regret and remorse, passing stop signs and lights without seeing them. His spirit had a hint of grief and a pinch of hate. What was scary was the homicidal and sanguinarious thoughts running rampant through his head. Lo had devious thoughts of seeing the police bleed uncontrollably. He wanted to see them suffer the same way Juan did. Lo wanted to see the officer dead on the ground, lying lifeless and comatose, the same way Juan was. The more he relived the incident, the more his violent aura increased. Lo was always known for being crazy and wild, but this incident provoked all negative and hostile spirits within him. His lust for revenge took complete control of him. Lo looked down at one of the many tattoos on his dark-skinned arm. The tattoo read, My Brother's Keeper. The tattoo reminded Lo that it was his duty to care for the people close to him. Juan was one of those people. Lo started formulating a plan to get even with the police. The only possible outcome that he could think of was murder. Lo stopped at a red light. Lo pulled his phone out and scrolled through his social media. Coincidentally, he saw the news footage of the police officers killing Juan. Lo's body stiffened, his attention tightened, and his eyes were focused. Malicious energy bounced off his eyes as he stared at the video. Lo was already enraged by the incident, but seeing the actual footage did nothing but agitate the situation even more. Lost malevolent dreams of revenge became tangible in his young 25-year-old mind. Lo devoted himself to evening the score. He vowed that the police officers who were involved were going to die tonight. The only opaque part he had to worry about was how to do it without getting killed or getting a life sentence in prison. Lo approached his house off to Quanger. From a distance, he spotted a man lying a few feet from his steps. Lo parked his car and watched the man. Lo assumed the man was a local drug addict by the way he twitched on the ground. Lo exited the vehicle and approached his house cautiously. Lo knew dope fiends in the hood were unpredictable. The man sensed Lo was coming close from the vibration of his footsteps. Swiftly, the man jumped to his feet. He was tall and lanky with a half-ripped shirt but no shoes. Lo analyzed his face and noticed something obscure about him. The man had blood dripping from his mouth and his eyes were dark, piercing red, damn near crimson. He walked closer and closer toward Lo until he was within reach. His nostril flared open as he approached Lo Lo. The man's jaw opened and closed so quickly that Lo had seconds to react. Lost reflexes were fast enough to avoid the bite. Lo couldn't believe what happened. This nigga, this nigga tripping. The man stood there silent with his red eyes beaming into the soul of Lowell. 
He lashed out against Lowe, but Lowe dodged him again. Lowe confrontationally squared up with him. What the hell is wrong with you? He asked. The man lashed out against Lowe again, but this time Lowe struck back. Lowe punched the man in the face, making him fall and immersing him on the ground. The man jumped back to his feet with a psychotic glare. He lowered his jaw, letting out a bloodthirsty yell. Lowe screamed, running away, taking off like a track star. The man took off running in pursuit of Lowe. Lowe tries to run to the best of his ability, but the man is oddly faster. Lowe throws a garbage can on the floor to try to block him. The man extemporaneously leaps over the garbage can with ease. You would have thought he played in the Olympics. Lowe runs faster to escape, but the man keeps up his pace effortlessly. Fuck! Like a white girl in a scary movie, Lowe trips and falls to the ground. Horrible timing! The man pounced right on Lowe like a lion on a gazelle. He started attacking Lowe, violently snapping at his limbs. Thankfully, Lowe fought back. He didn't plan on losing his life today. Lowe noticed a heavy rock close by and grabbed it. Lowe hits him with a powerful blow to the head, knocking his body off him. Blood splattered everywhere. Lowe jumped to his feet, striking the man. Again with the rock directly in his temple. His blood splatters on Lowe's face. Out of rage, Lowe ruthlessly strikes him again, showing no remorse. Lowe primal instincts were kicking all the way in. Lowe walloped the man so hard that his skull cracked, leaving him inert. His entire face was bashed on the concrete. Lowe stood there, looking at the man's bloody body he just brutally murdered. Then he looked at the bloody rock in his hand that he used to do it. Lowe ran in a panic and dropped the murder weapon, leaving his evidence behind. He had no destination. Lowe just wanted to get away from the crime scene. Lowe ran so fast without paying attention that he ran out into the middle of the street in traffic and got hit by a car. A black guy hopped out of an all-white Dodge Challenger Hellcat. He looked like T-Pain before he cut his dreads. The man wore a white T-shirt to match his all-white Air Force ones. The man looked at Lowe on the ground and assumed Lowe was dead. Damn it, I just killed somebody and I'm drunk as fuck. I'm about to get a murder case and a DUI? Nigga, I ain't dead, shouted Lowe. Lowe, that's you? I should have known it was your dumb ass. Get your ass off the ground. Tay, asked Lowe, recognizing the voice of the person who hit him. Tay, I'm finna whoop your ass. Tay extended his hand to help Lowe off the ground. He shook his head, laughing, locks swaying from side to side. Tay and Lowe were cousins and lived close to each other. Tay looked at Lowe from head to toe. The fuck are you doing running in the street? And why is blood on your hand? Man, crazy shit happened, Lowe replied. Up in the whip, Tay instructed Lowe. They both got back in the car and Tay pulled off. Tay took a sip from a red Solo cup and asked Lowe, what up, doe? What happened? I just got attacked by a crackhead, Lowe said. Tay bursts out in laughter, almost spitting out what he was drinking. Lowe didn't like Tay not taking him seriously. That shit ain't funny. This fool tried to bite me. He was chasing me and jumped on me. I had to knock his ass out with a rock. I think I killed him. Tay side-eyed him. Whoa, don't tell me that. You trying to make me an accomplice to a crime. I'm for real. I just killed somebody, and that ain't all that happened. Lil bro Juan just got killed by the police. Tay's energy changed. You talking about Lil bro that be on the block? Lo looked at Tay. Yeah, they just shot him like ten times. Damn, said Tay in astonishment. Lo sat back in his seat. It's all good, though. I'm going to make them pay for this shit. I was going to slide on them tonight and get my get back. They fucked with the wrong one. Tay slowly nodded. You're not about to do that shit by yourself. If you bout it, we can slide on them right now. Said Tay. Low peep Tay wasn't taking him seriously. Don't talk me to death. 
I know where we can catch them lacking. They about to be at the police station on Nevada, said Low. Tay sparked a black mild and uttered, That's not smart. You want to go to the police station to shoot a police officer. You might as well go on a suicide mission. No, we'll follow them when they leave the police station. Catch them slipping at a traffic light, then shoot the car up with their bitch ass in it. It's simple. Tay tells Low, man, I hear you and it sounds good, but can you handle that pressure? You kill a cop. It ain't no coming back. That's a life sentence. If we get caught, we ain't never coming home. So what? You're scared? Mocked Low. Low looked directly at Tay, trying to intimidate him. I ain't never scared. I'm from Six Mile, the fuck you mean, said Tay, while smoking his black mile. Low asked him to pass it because he was severely stressed and needed to smoke something. Low wasn't even the type to usually smoke tobacco, but he was desperate for mental relief. His mind was occupied by the negativity that held his attention captive. Tay drove around the corner to his house to plan how they were about to do this and make it out alive. You may wonder why Tay readily offered to help Lowe with such a sacrificial job. Lowe and Tay had a lot of history together in the streets. Lowe had taken the fall on a drug case for Tay a few years ago, causing Lowe to spend some time in prison. Due to that, Tay always respected Lowe and had his back no matter what. Tay was the type of person who would risk his life for you if you did the same for him. They approached Tay's house. It was a small brick house, nothing flashy. There were a lot of abandoned houses on the block. The abandoned houses once had people living in them. But when the economy fell in Detroit, so did the population. Lo and Tay entered Tay's house. Tay had a decent living room set with a nice TV. Tay sat down and Lo sat on the couch on the opposite side. Lo looked around Tay's house and noticed his bookshelf. Tay had several books in his collection. It was two books that caught Lo's attention. They were Think and Grow Rich and the autobiography of Malcolm X. Lo read both of those books while he was incarcerated. Tay noticed Lo observing his books. Lo, why are you looking at my bookshelf like yo illiterate ass know how to read? Tay asked. Lo chuckled. When I was locked up, that's all I did was read. Stop hating. Shit, I bet. You couldn't do shit else. Real talk, though. You a real one for catching that case for me without saying anything. Respect. Lo reached out and shook Tay's hand. We family. I'm my brother's keeper, Lo recited to him. Damn right. That's why anything you need, I got you on my mama. Lo and Tay conversed back and forth about the unfortunate events that transpired. Lo made his intentions more than transparent that he wanted immediate retaliation for what happened to Juan. Tay hopped off the couch and went upstairs, returning with two AK pistols. They fucked with the wrong ones. Tay grinned. Lo marveled at his artillery. Hand me the chopper. Tay passed Lo the assault rifle. Tay watched Lo childishly handle the gun. This shit ain't no game, Lo. You acting like you ain't never held a chopper before. If you're not ready, I can do this on my own. I ain't got time for you getting us locked up because you made a rookie mistake, Tay warned Lo. Lo spectates the gun some more. Lo replied, come on now, don't disrespect me. You know how I'm laying. I hear what you're saying, Lo. You better not start bitching up when it's time to shoot like Cuba Gooding Jr. did in Boys in the Hood. Lo shook his head. Chill out. I was going on drills before you even knew what a chopper was. Don't forget who taught you the game. Tay raised his eyebrows. Yeah, that's all cap. Since you are talking good, let's go slide then. We ain't taking my car. We have to drive the shooter. Tay had an old Chevrolet Impala with a fake license plate on standby for times like this. Come on, I'm waiting on you, Wo said. Tay and Lo left the house dressed in all black, equipped with guns. They snuck around the corner to the backyard of this abandoned house. This is where Tay kept his assault car hidden. They hopped in the car and proceeded to complete their mission. On the way to the police station, Lo tried to roll up some weed and smoke to calm his nerves. Tay stopped Lo before he could even get the weed outside of the bag. 
Tay reminded Lo that they didn't need to draw any extra attention to them when driving. On top of that, they did not want the car smelling like weed just in case they were pulled over by the police. Their hearts were racing during the car ride knowing they were taking a significant risk, but the revenge for Juan's death was worth it. When they arrived at the police station on Nevada, they parked on the other side of the street in a nearby parking lot. Tay ensured they had a clear view of who came and left the police station. They waited for about four hours for a particular police officer to come out, the one who initially shot Juan. Tay had fallen asleep. Lowe stayed vigilant and focused on the task. Lowe saw the police officer who shot Juan. Lowe tapped Tay, yo Tay, wake your ass up. There he goes. Tay immediately woke up in go mode and threw his ski mask on. Lowe did the same. The police officer got into his police car and came out of the driveway, making a left on Nevada. Lowe and Tay followed after him. The police officer drove down the street, unaware of the deadly threat stalking his every move. The officer approached a red light and stopped. Lowe and Tay both thought, this is the perfect time. Lowe and Tay's minds were synced. Tay drove up beside the police car with the passenger side closest to the police car so Lowe would have no problem aiming. Lowe's heart started to pound uncontrollably as they approached the vehicle and his body began to shake. Still, Lowe knew this was not the time to act afraid. Lowe rolled down his window and smiled at the police officer. Lowe drew his assault rifle out the window and shot expeditiously without hesitation. Bullets soared through the air into the police officer's face and the police car. The gun had a silencer, so it didn't make that much noise. By the time Lowe was done, the police car was beautifully decorated with bullet holes. Tay fled the scene right after the last bullet hit the police vehicle. Tay turned a couple of corners racing away from the scene. They drove in complete silence for a couple of minutes. Tay drives fast but not too fast because he is cautious about being pulled over. Tay drives into the backyard of an abandoned house not too far from his home. Tay parked the car behind the house, hiding it from anyone's view. He knew this would be the most secure spot to hide the car until he took it to a chop shop to demolish it. They exited the vehicle. Tay cleans the fingerprints off the guns as a precaution. Tay puts the murder weapon, ski mask, and gloves in a duffel bag, then placed the bag in a hiding spot inside the abandoned house. Lo and Tay walked down the street looking mischievous until they finally returned to Tay's house. Tay flopped on the couch. It's time to roll up. It's a celebration, motherfucker. Tay throws a bag of weed and a five-pack of backwoods at Lo to roll up. Lo was slow to grab the bag. His hand was shaking as he grabbed it. Yo hand shaking like a cheap stripper, said Tay with an amusing look. Lo's face remained serious. Before today, I ain't never killed anybody. Shit, today I killed three people and saw my brother get killed right in front of me. Tay tapped Lo on the shoulder, saying, that police officer got what he deserved. Do you think he was shaken when he killed Juan? The answer is no. Fuck the police. Lo kept quiet as he rolled the weed up. Lo did not regret shooting the police officer, but he did fear the consequences of his actions. Lo comprehended the repercussions of what he did. He knew that if he were to get caught, it would cost him life in prison. Tay interrupted Lo's thoughts. Don't worry, my nigga, you good. How are they going to know it was us? They ain't got no evidence. Lo ignored Tay, lit the backwood stuff with weed, and inhaled. The smoke cleared his mind and his anxious thoughts disappeared. His body was once tight but now relaxed. Lo inhaled it one more time and became even more comfortable. He inhaled it one more time and started coughing. Oh my God, you smoke like a fucking rookie. Pass me that shit, complained Tay. Tay took a massive hit of the weed and started coughing too. Damn, this some exotic shit right here. Where are Jizzle and Tez at? They need to hit this shit. Asked Tay. They on Arlington, replied Lo. Tay says, let's pull up on them and smoke some with them. I ain't seen they goofy ass in a minute. Fuck Tez, I ain't smoking with that nigga. 
He tried to blame me for Wong getting shot, said Lo. Tay replied, Lo, it was your fault. You know Wong was the last person to take on a robbery. Wong was a good kid, and he was Silver Spoon. The only reason why he went along with you was because he was trying to impress you. And you know this, Lo. Wong was a crash test dummy. Lo couldn't argue the truth. You're right, man. I feel terrible for putting him in that position. Juan looked up to me like a big brother, and I led him down the wrong path. We can't do nothing to bring him back from the dead. The best thing we can do is get payback. And that's what we did. Lo, we avenged his death, cheered Tay. Lo hit the weed again and blew a couple of smoke clouds. Tay sat up a bit. You need to squash that beef you got with Tez. Life is too short to have beef with your brother. You never know when the last time you'll see somebody. Lo nodded. That's real shit. That's all I speak is the real. Let's go slide on Arlington. Lo and Tay left the house and hopped in Tay's Challenger Hellcat. Tay was so high that he forgot he had another illegal gun in his car. Because of that, Tay did not care about how he drove. His driving was very reckless, which did nothing but increase the chances of them being pulled over. Tay was driving and listening to music with the volume up so loud that the whole hood heard it. Driving carelessly through traffic, passing red lights, and honking his horn so that others would get out of his way just so he could go faster. The streets were getting dark. It was about around 10 o'clock. There weren't many cars on the road, so anything unusual was noticeable. Tay's adrenaline was still pumping from the murder, and so was Loss. They managed to get their payback and got the chance to walk away to tell the story. They felt no one, not even the police, could touch them. The fact that they pulled it off was crazy. They were a couple of streets away from their destination. Tay made a turn onto a street without using his blinker. As soon as he turned on the street, he heard police sirens and saw flashing lights. Tay and Lowe's hearts dropped like they were about to have a heart attack. Tay pulled over to the roadside without realizing he had an illegal gun in the car. They waited on the side of the road for the police officer to step outside his vehicle. This was a preview of the first two chapters of Trapped in the Bando written by G. Hill. You can purchase the full book on Amazon. The link to the book is in the bio, and you can follow the author on Instagram at official G underscore Hill. Thanks for listening.